liver cancer has become the fastest increasing cause of cancer death in the United States. Now, several types of cancer can form in the liver, but the good news is there are multiple treatment options. We'll talk about those treatment options, prevention methods, and management of chronic liver diseases with a group of experts who are at the forefront of liver care. We'll take your questions and answer as many as possible. That's coming up now on At the Forefront Live. And today on At the Forefront Live, we have Dr. Palai and Dr. Liao. Welcome to the program. Thank you. We'll Thanks get to your me. questions in just a moment, but first we need to remind our viewers that the program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. And let's just get started, and we can have each one of you tell us a little bit about yourself and what exactly you do here at U Chicago Medicine. Sure, of course. Uh, my name is Anjana Palai. I'm a transplant hepatologist with the... Uh, with the Transplant Institute. I direct our, I'm the medical director of our liver tumor program and I'm also the co-director of our living donor liver transplant program. Dr. Liao? And I'm Andy Liao, one of the medical oncologists at University of Chicago here. Um, my focus is on liver and bile duct cancers and um, together with Dr. Pillai, we run our multidisciplinary clinic here. Dr. Plant, let's start with you and just talk a little bit about the liver in general and the functions that it performs for a person. Absolutely. So many people may not know this, but your liver is actually your largest internal organ. It's pretty remarkable and can sustain life when only about 10 to 20 percent of it is working, which is why many people actually don't know that they have advanced liver disease until they have symptoms. Uh, your liver does, it actually does the most jobs of any organ in your body. It's, it takes food and it breaks, it breaks down the nutrients for energy. It stores many of your essential nutrients and minerals. Uh, it helps regulate blood sugar and produces blood sugar. It helps, uh, produces many of your clotting factors so that you heal from surgery or when you get a cut. Uh, it produces bile, which helps you metabolize fat. It helps you fight infections. And just as importantly, it also helps detoxify your body. So it helps break down chemicals and drugs you may ingest as well as alcohol. Let's talk about liver cancer for just a moment. Is that becoming more common? I, I, know, I mentioned that in my, my intro and it's, it's something that I think a lot of people don't think about very much. Yes, absolutely. So liver cancer is now the fourth leading cause of cancer-related death in the world. And in the United States, it's the fastest growing cancer over the last several decades. Um, and so we have definitely noticed a rise in its incidence over all 50 states. It is the number one reason that patients are listed for liver transplant now in the United States. And in our, in our own center, over 50% of our patients that are listed for transplant, it's due to uh, primary liver cancer, or HCC. And Dr. Liao, what are the different types of liver cancer? So there can be many different types of cancer that happen in the liver. Um, there can be primary liver cancer, meaning cancer arising from the liver cells. But inside your liver, there are also millions of bile ducts um, that help drain out the bile to help you digest. And there can be cancer arising from these bile duct cells, and that's what's called bile duct cancer or cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and actually, the most common type of cancer that uh, can go to the liver is actually comes from somewhere else. For instance, you know, colon cancer that goes to the liver, or uh, lung cancer, or breast cancer, etc. So, Dr. Pillai, you mentioned that the, the cancer death rates, uh, liver cancer death rates, are increasing. Why do you think that, that that's happening? Why are we seeing this? Yeah, I think there's a few reasons. So just so we all orient ourselves, uh, liver cancer, I'll refer to as HCC, so primary liver cancer, because uh, Dr. Liao did mention there's several types of cancers that occur in the liver. But HCC often occurs in the background of cirrhosis, which is advanced liver disease. So about 80 to 90 percent of cases occur because you have end-stage liver disease. And the most common reasons are alcoholic liver disease, hepatitis C, or fatty liver disease. So the reasons that we're seeing an increase is also because there's an increase in cirrhosis. There's an increase in the number of patients that are now living with hepatitis C that have progressed to cirrhosis. We have better medications available, so people with cirrhosis are living longer. And also because of the rise of fatty liver disease, alcohol, and diabetes, which also contribute to cirrhosis, there's an increase in all those different ideologies that all lead to the risk of liver cancer. Dr. Liao, what are some of the symptoms uh, that a person might experience if they 
they do have a, a liver cancer. So um, a lot of times it's kind of non-specific, vague symptoms like um, feeling more tired, fatigue, um, unexplained weight loss or loss of appetite. Um, sometimes if the liver function is impaired, um, patients might notice symptoms like, you know, swelling um, in their legs and um, having bloating in their, in their abdomen, so fluid fill up inside their, their abdominal cavity, um, et cetera. I, I'm sorry, ahead, can I just build on what sure. Andy said? That's exactly right. Patients often don't present until they have symptoms. And so by that time, many times we don't have a cure, and I know we're gonna talk more in detail about that. So this is why, where surveillance comes in, and it's important to, you know, to undergo surveillance and look for risk factors that may potentially put you at risk for liver cancer. And can we talk about some of those risk factors? What would people need to be aware of? Obviously, you mentioned alcohol intake and obesity. Yeah, absolutely. So 90% of liver cancer happens in the background of cirrhosis. So anyone with cirrhosis, which is advanced liver disease or scarring of the liver, should undergo liver cancer screening. There's guidelines from the U.S. societies, from societies around the world, including Europe, Asia Pacific, and they all recommend an ultrasound every six months for anyone with cirrhosis. Also, that includes patients with hepatitis B, many of whom, or at least 20% of whom, don't necessarily need cirrhosis to have uh, liver cancer. So that subset of patients should also undergo regular screening, and there's guidelines for age related to that and when they should go undergo screening. So Dr. Liao, if we go through the screenings and it's caught early, is it treatable? Yeah, and in fact, uh, it's curable if it's caught early, and that, that's why screening is so important. So, What are some of the treatments that people might go through? So there, we've actually come a long way in how we treat liver cancer, how we treat um, primary liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so for patients with localized disease, you know, options include surgery or uh, even liver transplant, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then there are ways uh, to directly treat the liver. For instance, um, they can uh, go in and uh, um, burn off with our you know, we call it radio frequency ablation, but you know, burn off um, small liver tumors. There are ways to microwave, you know, uh, the small liver tumor, and then there's ways to go in directly to the liver with a catheter and uh, um, plant uh, radiation seeds in there to treat localized liver tumors that way. And then there are a lot of new treatments that. Uh, that treat the whole body for patients with more advanced cancers, you know, cancers that spread outside the liver. Um, these include targeted therapies and also immunotherapies. It's interesting, and, and immunotherapy is one of those areas that we've, we've talked about quite mm -hmm. a bit recently. What happens uh, in, in that case with the patient? So immunotherapy is a very different way of treating cancer, and, and it's been um, has generated quite a lot of excitement in cancer treatment, in not just liver cancer, but in many different other kinds of cancer. And it's actually been approved you know, in liver cancer and, and other uh, cancer cancer by the FDA. So the way in general it works is that it tricks your body to go after. So essentially it's like your body doing the job of attacking the cancer cells. So Normally, your body's immune system is very good at detecting, you know, um, bad cells. So, like, if you go out to the beach and get a sunburn, you don't immediately get skin cancer, and that's because your body's immune system recognizes that, you know, there are damaged cells and send th sends those damaged cells to go away. So, for a cancer to grow in your body undetected by your immune system, it must have somehow come up with ways to escape from your immune system surveillance. And so a lot of these new immunotherapy treatments that we have um, essentially unhides this cancer from your immune system and then your immune system goes after it. And um, studies in liver cancer have shown that, you know, it's, it's um, provided uh, significant benefits in our liver cancer patients. So. That's fascinating, and I love the, the sunburn analogy. I've never really <laughs> thought of it that way, mm -hmm. but that makes perfect sense. You know, your body does do a lot of the work to, to prevent some of these That's things, right. but can't always. That's fantastic. So um, let's talk about some of, the, some of the other treatment options. You mentioned them briefly, but what are, what are the more common treatment options and what should people expect? 
So I think, as Dr. Liao said, it really depends at the stage in which you're diagnosed. So again, just going back to the importance of surveillance, you know, um, by the time if you present with symptoms, some of the symptoms that Dr. Liao described earlier, oftentimes your cancer is advanced. And so, and oftentimes it's not curable. So this is why we have surveillance for liver cancer, because the whole idea of surveillance for any cancer really is if you have the options of curative options if, detect, if the cancer is detected early. So if you undergo proper surveillance, if you have cirrhosis or if you have hepatitis B and you detect a small lesion that's localized, meaning it hasn't spread, um, it's a certain size or a certain number, curative option includes resection, so taking or removing that tumor, which we work very closely with our transplant surgeons or our patobiliary surgeons, and then transplant. So as I stated earlier, liver transplant is a curative option and is the number one reason many of our patients, I'm sorry, rather liver cancer is the number one reason that many of our patients are on the liver transplant list nationally. So those, both those things are 100% curative. And then some of the other treatments that Dr. Liao recommended, such as, so we call it liver-directed therapy. So unlike most cancers, we're able to direct treatment right into the tumor itself, often through a catheter through your groin area. Um, and that's either radiation seeds or it's um, chemotherapy beads. Uh, we can also microwave or ablate that lesion. And then if it's more advanced, that's when the combination of either doing a local regional therapy or adding systemic therapy, which are many of the newer medications come into play. Um, for liver cancer, interestingly, until 2008, we only had one right. systemic therapy. Yeah. The next question from one of our viewers, if a lesion can't be biopsied, what are my options? A lesion can be biopsied. Okay. It absolutely can. Um, however, for liver cancer, we don't recommend biopsy if it's classic because there over the years, what we've learned is liver cancer has a very characteristic appearance on cross-sectional imaging, which is when you get a CT scan or MRI, but it has to be with contrast. That means there has to be a dye that goes into your IV. And if you have the right test, it looks very specific. And if it meets all those guidelines, then you do not need to be biopsied. If yeah, it saves you an invasive procedure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And but however, if and we review all these things, and yeah. we have a tumor board where we review every pa yep. patient and their case. However, if we are concerned that it might not be classic for liver cancer, or we're concerned that it could be a bile duct cancer, or mm -hmm. some cancers are mixed, then we will biopsy it. Right. And then for you know for patients that we're considering other newer forms mm -hmm. of therapy, patients with more advanced disease. Nowadays, we're getting smarter about personalizing each person's treatment, and so sometimes to consider patients for newer treatments, clinical trials, etc. Sometimes we would want a biopsy in that setting to see what kind of genetic changes there are in the tumor cells and see if we can find new targeted therapies or clinical trial options for that patient. Can we, can we talk about the tumor board for just a minute and explain to viewers what that is and what that does? Because I think that's very important. In, in your jobs. Can we talk about our tumor program first? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, Andy and I are both part of our multidisciplinary liver tumor program. We're very proud of it at the University of Chicago because we are one of the few centers in the Chicago land area that really have it and it's a one day clinic where there is a transplant hepatologist, a transplant trained surgeon, an oncologist, uh, an interventional radiologist uh, could all see the patient if they need to. And again, this is because liver cancer often happens in the background of liver disease, so you need expertise in liver disease and you also need expertise in oncology. And so when our patients come, we really try to determine, okay, who do you need to see? And to the best of our ability, we will see patients together mm -hmm. in clinic. Yeah. Our interventional radiologists will come up or their nurse practitioner will come up. Our surgeons are almost always available in clinic for us. And it really helps enhance the patient experience because yeah. they get quite a lot of time with all of us. Yeah, it's like one-stop shopping and it really just highlights, you know, because we have so many different treatment options nowadays for liver cancer, it's so important for um, every specialist to come together and um, deliver the best treatment plan, uh, individualized treatment plan for each patient. And so once we have that, once we see that patient in that clinic, 
then you know we have all discussed who sees the patient and then we have a tumor board every Thursday so all those patients go on that uh, tumor board where again all of us are present there's about 15 to 20 physicians that specialize in liver disease from different disciplines that come to the tumor board and then we make recommendations for treatment follow-up future treatments uh, transplant all of that's done then it goes into the medical records the patients are called so it's a very stepwise streamlined procedure uh, uh, process that we have implemented over the last two years and we're very proud of it yeah so we have another question from a viewer. Is the AFP tumor blood test accurate? That's a very good question. So the AFP is the alpha feta protein. Um, so it was, up until very recently, part of the surveillance. So we kept talking about surveillance, but I don't think we talked about what that entails. Mm -hmm. So surveillance means if you have cirrhosis of the liver or if you have hepatitis B and you're an Asian man greater than 40 or if you're an Asian woman greater than 50 or an African, not African American, Africans with hepatitis B greater than 20, you should be screened for liver cancer. And that includes an ultrasound of your abdomen at minimum every six months. And going back to the AFP, AFP was the tumor marker that was also uh, recommended in addition with the ultrasound. The issue is not all tumors produce AFP, only about 60% do. So it is a tumor marker that can help us prognosticate and uh, help us in surveillance, but because it's not seen in all tumors, if you just get an AFP, you may miss 40% of tumors. So I, I like that one because it just kind of illustrates a, a, yeah. a very complex situation, yeah. and that was a doctor that came to, to yeah. us for help, which was kind of neat too. So, um, one of the questions we had on the list was, uh, how long can you live with liver cancer uh, before you actually need a liver transplant? You don't obviously always need a transplant, but. Yeah, um, you know, again, I think it really depends on the stage at which you present. So if you undergo surveillance and it's caught before symptoms, it's caught early, of course, you're going to be more amenable to curative options, like we said, taking the tumor out or the transplant. Now, of course, that depends on the health of your background liver and your overall functional health yourself. Now, if you have more advanced cancer, you know, there's a lot of timelines, I'd say, once it's um, metastasized or goes outside the liver or goes into any of your major blood vessels, your five-year survival is lower. It's uh, about 10% However, that's before many of these new treatments came out. And keep in mind, these treatments just came out really in the last two years. So now we are seeing people that live longer. And so if they live longer, there's also newer treatments coming out. So that's where the idea of sequential therapy, meaning you start one treatment, if they fail, there's a second line treatment, there's a third line treatment or we go back and we reconsider the local regional therapy. We didn't have any of those options just even two years ago, which is why these statistics were so poor. Now, I'm not saying that we're anywhere close to where we would like to be to cure advanced uh, liver cancer, but I do think that we have many more options than, than we did uh, just a few years ago. And Dr. Liao, one of the advantages that we have here as an academic medical, medical center, we do a lot of research and clinical trials, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the clinical trials and research yeah. that may be happening in this area? Yeah, so um, as I said, you know, immunotherapy has generated a lot of excitement and there are a few drugs that already have been FDA approved for liver cancer, but we're always trying to improve upon current standards in immunotherapy. So a lot of the next generation clinical trials that are coming up are focusing on kind of these next generation immunotherapy approaches where they're combining immunotherapy with a different kind of immunotherapy or combining immunotherapy with targeted therapy or um, using you know, immunotherapy in an earlier setting, for instance, you know, starting patients on immunotherapy right after surgery. And um, some of the trials we have here, you know, one of them we have this very cool, um, it's called an oncolytic virus. So basically we, we um, hijack a virus to infect the tumor. So it's a kind of immunotherapy that way. I and mean, we've seen some pretty dramatic responses to that. We also have um, uh, trials combining current immunotherapies with what's called targeted therapy. So these are uh, drugs in general pills that target 
um, different ways that the cancer uses to grow. For instance, a lot of these target how cancer cells make new blood vessels, so prevents them from growing or spreading by inhibiting their ability to make new blood vessels. Um, we also have um, you know, studies looking at what's called metabolic therapy, meaning depleting key nutrients in the liver tumor microenvironment to make them more responsive to conventional treatments and uh, make the immune um, environment more favorable. So lots so, of exciting things going on. Yeah, it sounds like the research is, is really booming on this, just very exciting wow. things happening in, 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 in the world of science when it comes right. to liver uh, yeah, tumor and cancer, and cancer. So that's good news for all of us. <laughs> So, um, interesting question, a colonoscopy, can that help detect? Um, you know, we get this all the time. I do colonoscopies. I'm a gastroenterologist that subspecializes in transplant uh, medicine, but no. Okay. So, a colonoscopy looks at your colon, and many people always ask me if their liver looks okay. And I <laughs> say, I, you never want me to see your liver while you, I'm doing a colonoscopy, that far, yeah. because that means I went through <laughs> yeah. your peritoneum. <laughs> um, so, no, I don't see your liver when I do a colonoscopy. What it can tell us is if there's any masses. So colon cancer, of course, is the reason we do colonoscopies, colon cancer surveillance. And that is one of the cancers that do go to the liver. And we, are, we do see those types of patients in our clinic. And we're seeing these patients present younger. So colonoscopy is important. You should get colon cancer surveillance as well, which we have guidelines for. So in that regard, it's very important. But it's not a way to detect primary liver cancer. Interesting. Is there such thing as a, a benign liver tumor? And, and if so, does it hurt you at all? Can you live with it? Yes. So no, it does not hurt you. And okay. yes, there are benign liver tumors. So I, I actually give this lecture quite often. And the way that I look at liver tumors is benign lesions that never need follow-up, benign lesions that need follow-up, and then malignant things, like what we're talking about, liver cancer and bile duct cancer. So because we get cross-sectional imaging or a CT scan for so many reasons, we see all these new things or we see all these things pop up in the liver that you may have had your whole life that never ha will have any impact. So hemangiomas are the most common things, which is abnormal collection of blood vessels. You can see cysts. Uh, you can see focal nodular hyperplasia or adenomas. All of these are, uh, you know, they have different um, uh, there are different subsets of benign tumors. Some never need to be followed and some need to be followed or, or your uh, lifestyle modified a little bit. But absolutely, you don't need to chase every lesion that you see in the liver. So, so if you do have liver cancer, are you automatically added to the, the transplant list? And if so, how long does that usually take? Yeah. Thank you for that question too, because then I can plug this donate life, which is very important that is to very important, yes. uh, all of us. So. You have, to, so you don't automatically get on a transplant list no matter what. There is a pretty extensive workup our patients go through. Um, so in addition to an indication, which is often the advanced liver disease, or in this case, as you say, a liver cancer, we have to make sure the liver cancer is not too advanced because then we can't offer cure with the liver transplant. And then, but we also have to make sure you fit all the other criteria for liver transplant, that you're medically otherwise stable, that surgically the surgeons can do it, that you have good support system, that you don't have any psychological issues that bar treatment, that you don't have substance abuse issues, Issues. These are all just as important to get on that list. And once you get on the list, you know, the time is very variable. The United States is uh, divided into 11 regions by the United Network of Organ Sharing, which kind of controls this. And we're region seven. And so for our region, it can go anywhere from six to uh, 18 months once you're put on the list for liver cancer as to when you would get a liver and so for that reason we also have a living donor program at the University of Chicago Medicine so if we if you have relatives that could potentially donate or close friends or community members altruistic donors uh, that is also an option um, and I know we're over time but I just think okay. that purpose of organ donation you know the issue is we want to give livers to our patients we the problem is there's about only six to 8,000 livers that, that we do a year, and there's about 16,000 patients waiting on the liver transplant list. So just not enough uh, supply for the demand that we have. Well, you guys were fantastic. Thank you. This Thanks was so much lot. fun. And both so young. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's all the time we have for the program. Thank you for being on the show, and thank you for your wonderful questions. If you want more information, you can visit our website at uchicagomedicine.org, or you can call 888-824-0200. And also remember to keep an eye on our Facebook page for more events and live programs that will be coming up soon. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.